be seated. Appreciate you being here tonight um, on this beautiful day. This is a beautiful day after all the wind and temperature change yesterday. What a beautiful day. Um, the adventures of owning a convertible uh, that you haven't got to see around the rain because it hadn't rained hardly since I bought my car. Uh, the adventures of owning a convertible. I went and got in my car this afternoon, Michael Allen, and when I um, it doesn't have any leaks that, that hit, but I opened my door and I guess I left my door cracked yesterday and I had water sitting in the, um, in my, my hand area of my car. So I had to take my shirt, what this shirt, took the shirt I had on and was cleaning it up. Um, and all this shirt been working, putting floors in with. Tonight we're on message number three concerning the rapture. Again, as we know, the rapture is incredibly important. It's important for us to study. It's important for us to share with people about the rapture. Tonight, when we look at the rapture, I want to look at the mystery of the rapture. And I want to, let's go in the first Corinthians. This is one of the passages that we've talked about. We've talked about three main passages concerning the rapture over the last few weeks. Uh, but I want to look at this. We're going to Talk about the mystery. If I said the mystery. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is what we're looking at in this passage today. This passage starts off with talking about the mystery and the mystery that he's going to show us. Now, if you're like most people, most people like mysteries in some way. Uh, you, you like the, the mysterious thing. Maybe you like one of these that like mystery novels and you like to solve mysteries. And, and if you've ever they're, 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 they've watched a movie that was a mystery movie that, that you wanted to solve and see who the killer was or see who the criminal was and and don't you love it when there's some twists and turns in those movies? Uh, you know, I, I'm not a guy, I don't like horror movies or anything like that. Um, but I do like the mis mysteries and things, things that, that make you think and make you want to um, try to investigate and see if you can figure it out. And, you know, in the Bible, there are things that I guess if we go in the New Testament, we can see what are so-called mysteries and they're mystery to some people, but they're, they're mysteries a lot of times to this world. In fact, there are some things that we find written very clearly about in the Bible that is a mystery to this world. It really is. Um, how do we know it's a mystery? Because some things that people continue to do, even when they're told not to, or continue to, you know, sin is really a mystery to the world. That's not a mystery to the saint. And, and, and again, sometimes we quantify sin by picking certain acts that are sin. But sin is missing the mark with God. And this world does not understand it. And they don't understand why, why we as Christians call certain things sin. They don't understand that. And it, it's why when we go and, 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 and we're talking with the sinner, we can't assume that they understand everything about the gospel. We should never assume that. Because we probably don't understand everything about the gospel. and Or when a person becomes a Christian, fresh and new, a baby Christian. Um, you know, a lot of times we want a baby Christian to act and dress like we do. When guess what? They don't know any better. You know, you'd be surprised the things that, that people don't know that they shouldn't do. You say, well, I thought God deals with you. God will deal with them, but sometimes it takes a little time. Uh, you know, it takes a little time. And, and you know that not everything that you do when you get saved in the beginning or things you're going to do at the end. 
because you learn how to you, you learn how to change your life. You go through a process that's changing you. Even so, it, it's a mystery. God's holiness is a mystery. You know it's a mystery in this world. If God's holiness wasn't a mystery, then everybody would be living a holy life, wouldn't they? But it's a mystery to the world. Even the need of salvation. You say, oh, everybody knows they need to be saved. Don't assume everybody knows they need to be saved. I've shared with you this story before, but I, I think about it quite often. When, when I was pastoring in Marion in 2008, um, a family came and, and a, a mother ca called and asked if she could set up a meeting. She had a daughter that was 16 years old that was, in her words, she's a mess. She said, can, can we come and meet with you? And, and uh, so she brought her daughter. She said, well, since her daughter's a mess, she brought her young teenage son too. She might as well go ahead and get them both and, you know, see if she can get them both fixed up. And this woman didn't attend church. And I didn't know her. Perhaps she just called the church. She had an affiliation when she was a teenager, but this is a woman in her late 30s at this time. And so she comes by and we're talking and she's starting to tell me all the things her daughter does and the, how her, her daughter acts. And her daughter is 16 years old. Born and raised in Marion, Arkansas. Marion, Arkansas. Small town. Uh, it doesn't be much more small town than that. And in and, and Marion, Arkansas, where, where you think everybody knows about God. And so I began to talk to the young lady, and I said, I said, you know, what you need is to be saved. And she said, what is that? I said, do you know and understand salvation? I said, that, and she said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. She had never heard of salvation. How does a 16-year-old grow up in Northeast Arkansas and never hear about salvation? And so I had assumed that they knew that. The mama had had a history in church, but obviously the child, she had never told the child about it. And so I said, well, let me explain to you about Jesus. So we had been talking for an hour before I realized this kid didn't know anything about Jesus. So I began to explain about Jesus and, and, and explain the need for salvation in their life. And then... That evening, that daughter, the son, and the mama all gave their hearts to the Lord. And it became a great part of our church, a part of our life. And, and, um, and, and so, and, and a few years later, I got to marry that daughter um, to her husband. And, um, and, and so, you know, they didn't know the need of salvation because it was a mystery to them. But, you know, mysteries can oftentimes be revealed to us. And we find... You know, there, there, there's, a, there, there's the mystery of the crucified Savior and salvation by faith, you know. And, and, and again, the world doesn't see that, the crucified Savior, but we do. But even Christians a lot of times have a hard time with salvation by faith and we try to work our way into God. Now, I believe we ought to be servants and to serve God, but you can't work your way to heaven, can you? I mean, we're getting salvation through grace by faith and and that's, that's what we get. Some things are called mysteries in the Bible. The parables, if you go to Matthew chapter 13, you read the parables in Matthew 13, they're mysteries. The mystery of God's will, according to Ephesians 1, 9, that, that it can be revealed to us. But then Paul reveals the mystery of the Lord's return and his rapture. And so that's where we want to land the night in talking about that mystery. So what are the mysteries that we're looking at? The mystery of the, uh, as we go into this chapter, some things are going to be a little redundant from what we've talked about over the last few weeks, but I want to be clear about these things. Um, in verse 51, he tells us this. What does he say? He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And then follow that up with this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So right here in this mystery, he says, we shall not all sleep. One of the great mystery of this is, is sleep, of course, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reveals to us death. But he tells us not everybody's going to die. Now, what do we understand about death? You know, we, we understand that everybody has an appointment to death, right? I mean, we're all going to die at some point in our life unless... The rapture takes place while we're living. And if we're saved and the rapture takes place while we're living, then not all Christians are going to die. Now, 
I know that most of us, we've talked about it, we've preached about it, we've heard it preached about. Um, I know growing up in, in church when I was a young teenager, I heard Brother Clemens preach about the rapture and, and tried to scare me to death with it when I was a kid growing up. Every time, you know, I, 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 you know, I was old, but thank God I appreciate preachers that scared me a little bit. And um, it was good to be scared in the right way. And so I hope that the rapture scares some people in some form or some fashion. But uh, there were so many times, man, I thought I wasn't going to make it. Um, and, and, and so many times that, that I worried. And um, there's so many times mom said, if you don't like right, you sure ain't going to make it. Um, well, she really said that to my brother, not me. <laughs> but um, we, we all have an appointment with death if that rapture doesn't take place in our life. It really is the battle against death, isn't it? And when we say this, it's the battle, the rapture is the battle against death for Christians, but it's for those who are alive and those who are dead physically, it's the battle against eternal death, isn't it? That's what that is. You know, when we uh, look at the world, the world's trying to battle death, aren't they? Think of all the things we do. The doctors we see, the medicines we take, the things that we do to stop ourselves from dying. Nobody wants to die physically, do they? Nobody wants to die physically. I mean, we, we'll do all kinds of things to keep, you know, just so I can live longer, right? I want to live longer. Um, and then... You know, regardless, you know, um, I want to live longer. And so, um, you know, we, we have that. But you know, here's a statistic that everybody needs to know. Until the rapture takes place, here's what the death rate is. Did you put that? I think I gave that. Sister Connie, the death rate remains one death for one birth. It is. Why? Not to, I'm not talking about my death or the birth of somebody else. For my birth, I'm going to die. Unless the rapture takes place in my life. And so we need to understand that lifespan that we have, you know, is between, you know, in Psalms talks about between 70 and 80 years. And you look right now, okay, it's still around between 70 and 80 years. And you say people are living longer, but the reality, according to Scripture, people are living about the where Scripture told them they would. And so, but at the rapture, the rapture changes all this. If it happens during your lifetime, people who are alive, and, and those of you, and I don't believe all of you in here are saved, that you're saved, and guess what? If the rapture takes place while you're still living, you're not going to die a physical death. You're going to go from this life directly to the other life, and your body's going to become glorified. Think about it. This is pretty cool to think about. What if you get caught up in the clouds without going through physical death? Is that not a cool thing to think about? I mean, is that not a hallelujah thing? I mean, is, is that not, I mean, that, that ought to be a hallelujah thing for us. I'm, if, if I am blessed enough to make the rapture while I'm still living, now I'm not in control of that. It just happens to be, it happens to be God, what God's will is. Then that is so awesome. I'll be one of the, one of the millions that get to do that. But. Even if I do die physically, it's still awesome. The set part of this mystery, all Christians will be different. He says this, he says, we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. Now, I know most people don't like change, right? We, we, we don't like change. Change really freaks a lot of people out. Um, we don't like it. 
you know, I, th I was told that, you know, when you pastor or something like that, don't go into a church and change everything all at once. If you're going to move the piano in the church from over here to over there, do it one inch a week. Because that way, and then by the time people get, they get used to it that, that every week, you know, uh, because people just don't like change. I mean, look, uh, 12 years ago, uh, there were people from the Canada and that story. Now it's 13 years ago that he was retiring, and 12 years ago he did retire. And after being here 20 years, and and and, and people don't like don't like change. And I had somebody the very first night I did a meet and greet. The very first night came up to me and and uh, and said, "My pastor is gone." And she said, "I'm not happy about it." So what are you going to do about it? I'm not lying to you. What are you going to do about it? And I just looked at that dear lady and I said, I'm just going to love you. She said, do you have an answer for everything? I said, no, I don't. I don't have an answer for everything. You found out over 12 years I don't have an answer for everything. But she said, I, I said, I'm just going to love you. She said, well, I can't get mad at that. I said, okay. I said, I didn't, I didn't tell him to retire. That was his choice. But my point is, nobody likes change. I understand that. I understand that. I had a guy when the first time when, when we were pastoring in Marion, you know, it was just starting to get popular for churches to put up screens. And this old man, his name was Vince Berry. Vince Berry, how many of you ever, how many of you ever seen Batman movies? Anybody seen Batman movies? Anybody ever seen The Penguin? Vince Berry was The Penguin. He went to the Marion Church of God, okay? Uh, he did. He, uh, great guy. I got, the, I got the privilege of preaching Brother Vince's funeral, but we, um, <laughs> We, we, we decided, you know, we wanted, we wanted to update him. We bought a projector. We bought a big screen put up in our sanctuary. And, and the first Sunday, we used that screen. And, um, and, and he walked in. And he always came in. He wouldn't come to Sunday school. He would he'd come in during the middle of Sunday school and walk in the, walk in the sanctuary. And, and, um, and he always made an entrance when he came in. Brother Barry did it. He, he walked in the Sunday that we had, the first Sunday we had the screen up there, and, and it had bright lights on it, Marion Church of God, Boca Marion Church of God, and Sister Patricia looked at me and he said, are we getting ready to show movies in church house now? I said, well, we might. He said, what's that thing doing up there? And I said, well, Brother Barry, I said, that is a projector that's going to put the words of the sermon and the words of the song up there. He said, do you mean we're going to sing off the wall? I said, well, I, I, I guess that's what we're going to do. And he just looked at me. And, of course, he had that kind of penguin way he talked, too. And, and, I, and, and, and I, said, I said, but I said, just give me a minute. Just, just watch. I said, you know, you're nearsighted. And I said, when we sing a hymn, you have to open up that book. And, um, and so I think that day, that probably the very first hymn they sang was, We Shall See the King or something. It happened up on the screen. After church, he came up to me. You know, he said, you know what? You was right. He said, I could read those words. He said, I, he, said, he said, I can't read that hymn book, but he said, I could read those words. He said, he didn't like the change at all. Um, you know, and Lord knows, I didn't tell him when we finally decided to show a movie in church and we were going to show um, Facing the Giants. I just said, don't let him know about it, you know. Um, but uh, because his prophecy was going to come true. But we, um, you know, change is hard for people, isn't it? It's hard for all of us. If anybody knows me, I don't like to change what I eat. I like to eat the same thing every night or whatever. I would do that. But we're told here that we're all going to change. Which tells me that whether you're alive or dead, you're going to be changed. Folks, this, this one, this body down here is not going to be what makes it. This is not, not going to be what makes it. That's why I can live when we're doing uh, videos for church that I have a face made for radio because I know this is the face I'm taking with me to heaven. I'm getting a new one. I'm getting a new face. I'm getting a new body. It's going to be different. I'm going to be changed. It's going to, everything is going to be different. The dead and the living are going to be changed. 
that we're going to be changed. Resurrection power changes people. And this is the great resurrection that we're talking about. Resurrection power is, will change people. And you know how we are going to be changed? More than any one other thing that's going to happen in the change, according to the scripture uh, that we're finding in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, is you're going to be changed to be like Jesus. That's part of the mystery of the rapture. Now, I've been trying to become like Jesus as much as I can since I've been saved. But I haven't attained to that point where I could be like him. We're going to be changed to be like him. We are told in verses 53 and 54 of this passage that, that we just read a few moments ago in 1 Corinthians 15, there's going to be no more corruption, no more decay. This pit, we, we've been working on, um, on the floors I've got cuts. I've got scrapes. I've got. I, I had. I had. I guess I. I get, shed enough blood for the first time. I got deferred yesterday when we were doing the life, uh, doing the Red Cross blood drive. Um, I got deferred, and the people who always get deferred got to give blood, and um, and so um, I figured some of that. And I, I got a blister. Your pastor got a blister on his hand. You know what that proves? That proves I'm a pastor. And, and, and I guess the physical work got to me there. Um, and I had a blister. And nobody even feels sorry for me. I got a blister. These things, are you what these tell me? That my body is corrupted. This band-aid is on here because my body is corrupted. You know, our body corrupts because it decays. And whether we like it or not, our bodies decay. Now, I'm going to tell you. You can color your hair all you want, but it's going to turn gray or something. You can, you can um, do all the exercise you want, but at some point in time, this body is decaying. It's decaying every single day. I know it's decaying because when we pulled the carpet up in the, in the living room, I saw all the bodily decay that was under that carpet. Because you do know 75% of the dirt in your house comes from human skin, right? It comes from human decay. And all that dirt that was under that carpet has been under there for, and it's not just our dirt. <laughs> not just the Pinky's dirt. That was Watson dirt. That was Decatur dirt. And it was Pinky dirt. And you can tell them too I said that. <clears throat> because we decay. But that's going to change. No more mortality. How do you like that? What does it mean that there's going to be no more mortality? We're going to live forever. We're going to live forever. And that's going to be accomplished in just a very swift moment. I think that's just so awesome to think about. All Christians are going to be different. All Christians should become diligent. We should become diligent. The very last verse in this, in this chapter says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in vain in the Lord. So because we know that the, the opportunity for us to make that rapture, whether dead or alive, while we're living, we are supposed to remain diligent. And that means we're supposed to continue doing what we're supposed to do. You know, diligent, when we think about being the, the dead being raised, when we think about the alive being raised, that we're, what we have to understand is we get this victory in us because we are diligent servants of the Lord. Folks, it's not time to give up. I know that there's lots of rocky roads ahead. I know that there's going to be bumps in the road in your life, bumps in the road in your family, bumps in the road in your finances. I know there's going to be good days. I know there's going to be bad days. But I, again, Paul gives us this admonition. He says, be steadfast. Be immovable. This world wants to move Christians, wants to move us from our belief system, deconstruct, if you will, our belief system. 
They, 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 this world wants to do that. But, but here's the thing. If we remain diligent and steadfast, then we're always, when he says always abounding in the work of the Lord, in other words, God's always working on us and we're always working on him. This is not a ploy or a plea to try to find new labors in the church. The reality is that, that being steadfast and diligent to God means I'm always looking to serve God. I'm always looking to do that. I, I, can, I can still enjoy the things, the godly and the good things of this world and serve God. I can still have a good time in this world and serve God. Just my good time is different than what the world's good time is. My God, we can call the hogs every single Saturday, but still serve God, can't we? And uh, whether we win or lose those games, we can still serve God. You know, I, you, can, you can go shopping tomorrow and spend all your Christmas money, your Christmas budget, and enjoy that, that if, you, if, if you want. And, and you can still serve the Lord and be diligent for Him and working in, 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 in service for Him. You can, you, can, can, you, can, you can go and you can enjoy... The, the, the things that I, I, I'm going up tomorrow morning, I'm going up, I'm going to be 3,000 feet in the air tomorrow and Friday morning. Uh, and I'm going to do those, I, I'm doing those things. But when I get down off that plane, I'm going to do the work of the Lord. Maybe going to the hospital and maybe doing different things. You know, so you can have, you can enjoy things and have, ha, and, and have things in life, but that doesn't keep you from serving the Lord, does it? Of course not. Of course not. We, we, have to, we have to prioritize, obviously, but it brings us our victory. By staying and serving Him, we're promised great, great victory, folks. I mean, I just love how He, he tells us that we have victory over the grave, that we have victory over death. See, even if you die physically, because you stay diligent to the Lord, You've already beat death. And all the advances and medical advances that we have that keep people alive and, 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 and that, that try to extend human life, the reality is if, if, if we die and we remain diligent, that death doesn't matter. That physical death doesn't matter, does it? Because we're going to, at some point in time, be in the presence of the Lord. What great victory is that? Isn't it awesome? The fact that if you go in the rapture alive or if you go in the rapture as, a, as the dead being raised, you've won victory regardless, right? This is an awesome thing. Death does not win against us. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Do you understand that we have this great victory? That's, you know what I found? When I get discouraged in serving the Lord, this scripture reminds me that it'll all be worth it. That it'll be worth it for eternity. That it'll all be worth it when we see Jesus face to face. It will be worth it. I told you, when we began this study, we'd be, we would end every week with three reasons the rapture could happen today. They're the same three reasons every time. But I want to remind you of these because these can help you. Three reasons the rapture can happen today. The rapture is a signless event. In other words, there's no signs left that have to happen for the rapture to take place. I mean, the, the, what we would call the doctrine of imminency that is the rapture is imminent. So when could the rapture happen? When? Any time, right? That, that's what that means. The rapture could happen at any time. Nothing has to take place for the rapture to happen. For those who are lost, every moment that they get extra is grace of God and mercy of God. And I'm praying 
And, and, and this is something, because of the imminency of the rapture, we should be praying daily about lost souls who need Jesus. Because, can I ask you this? Who do you not want to go to the rapture? See, I can't think of anybody that I want to miss the rapture. Well, Brother Pinky, what about that murderer? What about that drug dealer? Folks, I'm praying for their salvation too. I can't imagine anybody not wanting somebody to go to heaven. One of the worst, I guess if I'm watching movies or TVs, the thing that makes me upset more than anything else, I guess other than I'm using God's name in vain, is when I hear an actor or somebody tell somebody to go to hell. What a terrible thing that is. Isn't that a horrible thing? When I've heard people say that to somebody else, I, as a Christian, we should never want anybody to go there, right? I don't want anyone to go to hell. I don't want anyone to miss out on the glory of God. And I know that there are people who aren't. Uh, of the over 250 funerals that I've preached since I've been pastoring, I, I know that, that there are people that I've preached their funerals that, that, that probably didn't make it. And, and it bothers me when I think about it. It bothers me when I, have to, when I have to question it. It really does. So that's why, because of the imminent nature of the rapture, I want to win people to the Lord so that they can make the rapture. You know, I look at every single one of you. And I'm looking at the people who are going to watch it on YouTube. And I sit and I think, I want to be in heaven with all of you. I do. And I mean that. I mean that sincerely. I want to be in heaven with all of you, with all of your family, because that's what we want. There's nothing that has to take place in God's prophetic realm for the rapture. The second reason the rapture could happen today, the rapture is a surprise event. In other words, when that trumpet sounds, it's a surprise. Now, we know in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul tells us that, that this is not, that he's not coming as a thief for those who are in the light, right? He's coming as a thief for those who are in the dark. We have an idea of the time frame, perhaps, but we don't know when it's going to happen. The rapture could happen tomorrow morning. The rapture could happen while you're at work, or, or bless God, the rapture could happen before you go to work. Wouldn't that be good? Uh, the rapture, you know, we don't know. We don't, it's a surprise. It's going to be a surprise. I mean, you read the scripture, and, and, and we don't know what you're going to be doing when the rapture takes place. Which is why we should all be guarding what we're doing, shouldn't we? The rapture, because of the, 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 there's no predicted date for it, that's why it catches us by surprise. You know, nobody, Jesus, nor the angels, know when this event's going to take place. They're waiting on the Father to give them the time frame. And not knowing when Jesus will come for his church, I think is, to me, one of the greatest aspects of studying the rapture. Why, why, Pastor? Not knowing when Jesus is coming causes his church to stay ready at all times. Reason number three, the rapture. It's a sinus event. It's a sudden event. Or excuse me, it's a it's a it's a sinus event. It's a, it's a surprise event. It is a sudden event. I love it. This passage we just read just a few moments ago. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I want everybody to do something for you. We're going to we're going to do a little audience participation here. But right, open your eyes real wide, like that. Go ahead and go ahead, hold them open. Okay. You're not going to look like a fool. Go ahead and hold your eyes open. Now then, uh, let them go. Let them go. Now, I want you to try to keep yourself from blinking. All right? Yeah, I know. You can keep yourself from blinking for a little while. Sister Peggy's doing a staring contest with me right now. But... In the twinkling of an eye, 
Now, the one thing I can tell you about my wife, there's always a twinkle in my eye when I see her. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that event will take place. That quick. The rapture could happen today. That's why it's imperative for us to continue doing what we are supposed to do for God. So here's what I want to encourage you to do today in this great mystery of the rapture. I encourage you, one, continue with yourself. Always, you stay ready. You know, the ten virgins, the five were wise and five were unwise. Be that five that are wise and always keep oil in your lamp to be ready. But the second thing that I would encourage you to do is pray for those you know who are not saved. Pray for them. The third thing to do, ask God to help you with the opportunity to share his beautiful gospel with people who need him because people desperately need the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, dear God, for this great, great word, dear God, this great, great promise, dear Lord, that we have. We thank you for it, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We ask, dear God, that you would touch us, dear Lord, as we, as we continue to study this great, wonderful the event of the rapture, dear God, that it would be something that, dear God, would motivate us to not only be ready, but to help others get ready. Not only for us to not just be warned, but, dear God, that we would be able to give people warning of that to encourage them of this great good news. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings. Thank you, dear God, for the for answer to prayer, dear God, for those who we hear these great reports. And, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Michael, before you leave, you need to go look at, at my desk or my, at that table.